Okay, well, good morning. First, I'd like to thank uh, Yairo for inviting me to give this talk. And I'm just a, a substitute. I'm substituting for Albert, who could not come. And then, <laughs> secondarily, I'm, I'm Claudia's decoration, as she would say. <laughs> so for those two reasons, anyway. And nevertheless, I'm happy to be here. And uh, some of you may know that I recently moved to Germany two years ago uh, to become a director at the Max Planck Institute for Microstructure Physics in Halle. And this is Halle. It's a, it's a nice city. And I did check this morning. The uh, amount of rainfall in Halle is 25% below that of Mainz. <laughs> so this is an excellent reason for coming to Halle. What I'd like to do then is a subject uh, very different from Claudia's, but it's about materials and in particular about spin orbitronics and how in particular we could use this potentially to build some interesting mm -hmm. magnetic memories. So some of this work was carried out at IBM and some of it in Halle. So this is Halle. Uh, the, I'm also at the university which is nearby. This is the institute which we're currently renovating and rebuilding. And in that regard, we have a lot of open positions for people ranging from PhD studentships to postdocs to junior group leaders to uh, we're looking for new directors for the institute as we evolve the institute uh, to, uh, in, in new directions, which I'm happy to talk about. But what I'd like to do today then is discuss how can we use recent developments in spin orbitronics to build interesting memories. And a memory that uh, I'm very, I like very much, which I proposed a few years ago, is something I called racetrack memory. And the essential idea is that we go away from the two-dimensional paradigm of today's logic and memory technologies and build a memory that is innately three-dimensional in the form of these vertical magnetic wires in which we magnetize regions in one direction or the other direction, the red and blue regions. And essentially, we store information in the presence or absence of the magnetic domain walls that are boundaries between these blue and red regions. And the concept is that if we can manipulate these domain walls by creating them, and then we can move them all together around this racetrack to create a shift register. We shift the information around using certain types of torques I want to discuss. Then at one point along the racetrack, there's a, re a writing device and a reading device. So this means that in the same area of a silicon wafer today, where you could store one bit, we could store as many bits as we can create domain walls and manipulate them in these vertical nanowires. And then we would achieve the capacity of a magnetic disk drive in a completely solid state memory with no moving parts. And it's very interesting that in the last 10 years, we've made a huge, uh, huge progress. We've demonstrated the principle. And we've, uh, uh, we and others have discovered entirely new physics that makes this memory concept even more interesting. I'm going to briefly discuss that. So originally, when we first started this concept, the, the, the way of manipulating magnetization was this one. This was essentially based on two concepts. One by Neville Martin in the 1930s, that if you introduce an unpolarized current from a battery into a magnetic material, automatically it will become spin polarized, because upspin and downspin electrons will be scattered at different rates, leading to polarization of the current in simple magnetic metals like nickel, iron, and cobalt of about 60 or 70 percent. This essentially is, is, of course, does lead to giant magnetoresistance. But more importantly, this means that when you pass a current into a magnetic wire, the current automatically is carried by electrons of one spin orientation. And if you can change that, the angular momentum, then the spin angular momentum from those conduction electrons can be converted to the rigid magnetic system that forms the domain wall. Then you can basically move the domain wall as you transfer spin angular momentum from the current into the domain wall. And that uh, is something that uh, we demonstrated uh, a, little bit, a, little, a few years ago. But in principle, then, all the domain walls move in the same direction of the current. And this is essential for racetrack memory. So when we started, this hadn't been demonstrated. And we demonstrated this uh, just under 10 years ago in this paper in Science, where this was the first demonstration of a current-controlled magnetic domain wall nanowire shift register, where we detected the domain walls in the, in the wire by resistance, each of the domain walls if you like, has a quantum of resistance that we can detect. And so we can detect by changes in the resistance of the wire the number of domain walls. And we could basically show we could encode information in this way. However, this was using magnetic wires. These are uh, a micron or so wide. And the domain walls themselves are very broad, because in these materials, which are magnetically very soft, then the width of the domain walls is controlled by the magnetostatic fields. So we need to do more than this. And if you like, this was uh, 
I like to call this uh, racetrack memory, the first edition. And since then, we've gone through several more editions, if you like, several more stages. And the ones I want to talk about are these last two stages. So we showed this is the first stage where we have in-plane magnetized wires. Turns out by using multi-layers of, for example, cobalt and nickel, you can turn the magnetization perpendicular and you can drive the domain walls, even though they're much narrower, with exactly the same uh, concept that I just discussed. And with this concept, spin polarized current, through volume spin-dependent scattering, you can move these domain walls in the direction of the spin angular momentum flow at about 100 meters per second for useful current densities. So current densities that are useful are those that essentially don't heat the wire too much or cause migration of the atoms. So typically, we can put current densities of about 10 to the 8 amps per square centimeter without significant temperature rise and without atom migration. So in both these cases, whether the magnetization is in-plane or perpendicular, using volume spin-dependent scattering, the domain walls move in the direction of the, uh, in the, direction of the uh, angular momentum flow. Now, what was uh, very, very interesting was uh, in uh, just a few, three or four years ago, then uh, Mihai Miron demonstrated that in an ultra-thin layer of cobalt on a platinum underlayer with an aluminum oxide capping layer, that the domain walls move in the opposite direction to the spin angular momentum generated through volume spin dependent scattering and at greater speeds. And the question was why? And so we and others were able to show the mechanism for that, which I want to briefly discuss. It's a little bit complicated. But again, this concept then is innately three-dimensional. So this is, if you like, now we're switching to the third edition of Racetrack, in which we now have a magnetic racetrack, which is formed from a sandwich of, in this case, these two green layers are a few angstroms of cobalt separated by, in this case, nickel, this blue layer, which is, so this whole racetrack is only one nanometer thick, and we deposit this on a heavy metal like platinum, shown here. One can also put the platinum on the top, and it turns out that uh, Michai's concept was that you actually had some rush bar fields between an insulator on the top and this uh, in his case, a single layer of cobalt. Turns out we don't believe that mechanism is the correct one. The correct one is related to converting charge to spin current in these heavy metal, let's say, platinum layers through what is called the spin hall effect. I'm going to briefly come back to that. But in this case, this, uh, this uh, is a Kerr image. We, we take basically use a Kerr microscope to look at these domain walls. And these domain walls, about 20 of them, are moving backwards and forwards at speeds of about 300 meters per second, so several times faster than is possible using volume spin-dependent scattering. So there are basically four spin-orbit derived phenomena that are important. One is the, just the perpendicular magnetic anisotropy itself. And it turns out again, in a long time ago, 25 years ago or earlier, the Phillips Research Group theoretically predicted that if you took alternating layers of nickel and cobalt, the interfaces lead to a broken symmetry and cause the magnetization to go perpendicular. And it turns out this is true for many magnetic multilayers. But the most interesting one here is, in our mind, cobalt and nickel. And this is then the first, if you like, effect derived from broken symmetry in spin orbit coupling. Another one very important is, I'm not going to discuss much about it, is at the same interface between, let's say, this cobalt layer, this green layer, and the platinum, you get what's called a dilzhinsky maria exchange interaction, which is a vector exchange interaction, meaning that at the interface, you cause the magnetic moments in the cobalt layer no longer to want to be perpendicular, uh, parallel to one another, but to be orthogonal to one another in a vector manner. So it's a chiral interaction. And so what does that mean? That means if you wander along this racetrack and you have a magnetic domain pointing up and then another one pointing down, in this domain wall, the magnetization rotates from an up direction to a down direction in the plane along the racetrack, such that in the middle of the domain wall, the magnetization will point to your right. But in the very next domain wall, where the magnetization rotates from a, a down to an up direction, the magnetization will point to your left because of this chiral vector dilzhinsky maria exchange. And this concept, this, this notion that you could form such type of walls was actually first, I think, found in ultra-thin layers of iron on tungsten 
in Roland Wiesendanger's group in, in Hamburg in some very beautiful STM experiments where they could follow the, essentially the complete structure of the walls. Well, here we infer this from actually the domain wall motion. It's necessary in order to explain all the domain walls moving in the same direction that we have these nail walls. And they can be, if we change this underlayer from platinum to tungsten, we can change this, the, the nature, the, the clockwise walls become anti-clockwise in this way. Now, so this is very important. I'm not going to talk about this. There's also a very strong proximity-induced magnetization, which means this magnetic layer of cobalt through exchange will cause the platinum to become magnetic. And in the type of structures I'm talking about, the moment that we're moving with current, one third of that moment is from the magnetization induced in platinum. So it's really an enormous effect. But uh, the most interesting effect I want to briefly discuss is this spin hall effect. So this is one of a family of means of converting charge to spin current. So the concept here is that if you introduce a current into a heavy metal wire, you generate a spin current, which essentially is uh, around the circumference, around the edge of this wire. And again, it's a chiral phenomenon. So it will either ro be rotate in a clockwise direction or an anti-clockwise direction depending upon the nature of this charge to spin conversion. And again, this is uh, rather complicated. The, the effects can take place either through extrinsic means, through scattering, or through intrinsic means, through barrier-phase effects related to the uh, characteristics of the electronic structure of the materials. But it turns out that this concept of a spin hall effect is relatively recent. It was known about in the 1960s, but experimentally only discovered about 15 years ago. But in the last few years, the efficiency in simple metals of charge to spin conversion has become quite large, of the order of up to 30 or even 50%. That means one charged electron can 50% probability create a spin polarized electron. This is enormous and very useful technologically. Now, just as an aside, uh, the group of uh, Bob Berman and Dan Ralph developed a very elegant technique to measure the spin hole angle by passing a current into, let's say, a heavy metal layer like platinum. You create this spin current, a spin accumulation at the interface, and then this pure spin polarized electrons will diffuse into a neighboring magnetic layer and will provide a torque because they're delivering spin angular momentum. So that causes the moment to rotate. And if you do this at microwave frequencies, you can put that layer into resonance. And at the same time, the charge current itself creates an Ersted field. And that Ersted field also gives rise to a torque. Now these two torques are out of phase. And by essentially measuring the torque derived from the spin current and the torque derived from the charge current, you get a ratio. Automatically, you can give the spin hole angle, the ratio of the spin to charge conversion. It's a very elegant technique, but there are some, uh, not downsides, some complications, one of which that we identified was that these interfaces are not transparent. So the spin polarized electrons created in the heavy metal layers, don't, not all of them diffuse across into the permaloy. And uh, without going into any details, what happens is that in the case of, let's say, using a magnetic layer permaloy, the interface is not very transparent, and only one in four of the spin polarized electrons created through this spin hall effect passes into the permaloy. But the cobalt interface with platinum is much more transparent, and one in two of the spin polarized electrons cross to the interface. So you need to take account of this transparency in order to properly determine the spin hall angle. And when you correct for all these effects, you find that the spin hall angle in platinum is about 20% which is really enormous because, as I said just a few years ago, the size of these effects, which was first discovered by David Oshlom's group in the Galley Mars night, was of the order of 10 to the minus 4. So it's much bigger now. So I'm not going to discuss that in any more detail, but to say over the last uh, two or three or four years, large spin hole angles have been discovered in platinum, certain structural forms of tungsten and tantalum, and uh, we've also shown the largest effect in a oxidized form of tungsten which stabilizes a particular structural phase. But I want to briefly discuss a triangular antiferromagnetic system. In some sense, this relates a little bit to Claudia's talk, where Claudia was, uh, gave a very nice talk about topology. And now the topology of the magnetic system itself can lead to very interesting effects. And one of the most interesting antiferromagnets is this triangular antiferromagnet. And this uh, simple one is iridium manganese 3. This is an FCC.
And in the 111 planes of this FCC lattice, then the manganese moments, they're on this uh, triangular lattice through frustration. They really want to be anti-parallel to one another, form this triangular s s lattice where the moments point at 120 degrees to each other. What does that mean? Now, it turns out in iridium manganese, because it's a cubic system, there are many of these 111 planes. There are eight domains in which we can form these, uh, these, 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 uh, this structure. Uh, and the structure itself is chiral. So it has a chiral structure, and it can be rotated in one chiral direction or the other. And those two chiral domains can give rise to very different transport phenomena. And if you like, you can assign this to some kind of Berry phase field, a fictitious field derived from the electronic structure, which the electrons sense. And this leads to several interesting effects. And I want to briefly talk about this spin hole effect. So if we measure it again through this concept of uh, RF excitation, using the spin current to excite a neighboring magnetic layer, let's say palmoloid, then you see very interesting effects. First of all, if we make this iridium manganese film very, very thin, we find that the spin hole angle we derive is independent of any field-induced annealing effects. So if we take this system, magnetize the permaloid, let's say with a perpendicular field, go above the so-called blocking temperature of the antiferromagnet, where there's not enough anisotropy to maintain the orientation of the domains, then the exchange field on cooling can reorient these magnetic domains. What we find then is that if we perpendicularly magnetize and field cool through the blocking temperature, we can dramatically increase the magnitude of the spin hole angle from what was about 20% to up to 40%. And so we believe that this increase is related to the magnetic domains themselves. And once we orient them in a particular way, we can increase the magnitude or we can see the uh, effect of the spin hole derived uh, scattering from that lattice. And just as an aside, if we make the iridium manganese too thin, below about two nanometers of room temperature, then there isn't enough anisotropy at all, and the domains rotate, so this field annealing disappears. Or if we make the iridium manganese thicker than about five nanometers, then its blocking temperature is so high that we cannot access it without melting the films. So it's only in a very minute thickness range that one can see these effects that field-induced repopulation of the magnetic domains can uh, give rise to this very large enhancement of the spin hole angle. So why, why do we see this? And the idea is that uh, well we, we thought this was because of scattering from these lattices and the intrinsic effect. So Bing Ha Yang in Claudius' group calculated the electronic structure and he calculated both the anomalous hole effect and this spin hole, anomalous hole conductivity and the spin hole conductivity and for two chiralities of the magnetic structure. Now, of course, this supposes that this is the correct magnetic structure in these thin layers, which is difficult to determine because they're so thin. Nevertheless, uh, interestingly, you can see that the anomalous hall conductivity changes sign when we change the chirality. But because of symmetry, the spin hall conductivity does not change sign. So in some sense, it's easier for us to observe the spin hall angle than the anomalous hall effect. And as an aside, then, this idea of anomalous hall effects in systems with no net moment was uh, first proposed by Alan MacDonald and also by Claudia Feltzer and Jürgen Kubler. It's a very interesting concept that even with no net magnetization, the, you can see the magnetic lattice. It gives rise to a hall conductivity, effectively because of these large berry phase fields. So this is very interesting. So you see the spin hole conductivity actually in the system also uh, can be derived from many different faces. So it turns out in this triangular system, you can derive spin currents in many different directions, which is also technologically extremely interesting. As an aside, uh, one can in some triangular systems, in particular, this is the hexagonal form of manganese 3 germanium. These are single crystals grown in, in Claudia's group. Uh, and uh, what one finds is this system, it's known to have a small in-plane magnetic moment. So it's not exactly 120 degrees. And with that mag magnetic moment, you can change the chirality of this system. And then very beautifully, you can then see an anomalous hole conductivity that changes sign either as a function of degree or by changing, applying a small magnetic field which reverts uh, 
the, um, the, the orientation. Otherwise, you really couldn't see this anomalous hole conductivity. So this is very interesting. These types of non-collinear spin textures give rise to large anomalous hole and spin hole conductivities. So just to summarize this part of the talk, then we can see that over the last uh, 13 years or so, uh, the first observation of a spin hole angle of 0 0.0001 in gallium arsenide, we now achieved up to 0.5 in simple metal systems, making it technologically very relevant. And I want to just briefly show you how we could use that to move domain walls. So the point there is, this is a cartoon. Here's the racetrack here looking on top. This is the magnetization pointing towards you in blue, away from you in red. This is the domain wall. And when we then introduce a Dilozinski maria exchange vector through an interface with a heavy metal like platinum, as I said, we now have a chiral domain wall. This one, the moment, points to the left because of this uh, exchange field, and this one to the right. Now when we introduce charge current, <coughs> we generate a spin accumulation in a direction perpendicular to the charge current. Therefore, the magnetization feels a torque, and this torque causes the moments to rotate towards this spin accumulation. And because now the magnetic moments are no longer oriented along this DMI field, they see a torque. And this torque is such that it will cause these moments here to rotate to become in the blue direction, and these ones to rotate in the red direction. And so now the two domain walls will move in the same direction only because um, of this chiral domain walls. If it was not chiral, they would move in random directions. So this is critical. This is why it took some time for us and others to understand this effect. It's quite complicated, as you can see. But we believe, then, it's a spin hole derived spin currents that are driving these domain walls, which is not, as I said, what uh, Mihai believes. And then the domain walls move at speeds of several hundred meters per second. Now, on the other hand, uh, these domain walls I showed you have these long-range dipole fields. So as in all spintronic or magnetic technologies, you have to take care of these long-range fields. Otherwise, they cause massive uh, interactions, and the dipole fields on the nanoscale can be hundreds or thousands of versatiles for simple magnetic elements. So it's impossible to build any type of magnetic device without eliminating them. And so one uh, approach you could use, which is something I invented many years ago, is we could use something I call a synthetic antiferromagnet. So in the case of racetrack, you build the first racetrack, and then you put down a thin layer of ruthenium, which for certain thicknesses will cause antiferromagnetic coupling. You put a second racetrack on top, and now whatever structure, whatever domain wall structure is in the lower racetrack is exactly mirror imaged in the upper racetrack, maintaining the chirality of the domain walls. And it turns out that when we did this, we discovered that uh, the velocity of these domain walls was increased from, let's say, 200 meters per second in a racetrack with ferromagnetic coupling to almost 1,000 meters per second in a racetrack with antiferromagnetic coupling. And the reason is, very simply, this exchange field across the ruthenium layer is so strong, it gives rise to an additional torque that is several times stronger than the torque derived from the Dilizhinsky Maria exchange fields themselves. <coughs> and then they move at, uh, here's the synthetic antiferromagnet, now they're moving at speeds of about a kilometer per second. Very interesting technologically. And this is derived, if you like, from this complex interplay of four spin-orbit-derived phenomena that I mentioned, perpendicular magnetic anisotropy, proximity to moment, which I didn't discuss, chiral domain walls, and these spin currents from the spin hole effect. So it's super interesting. Now, just as an aside, uh, I have five minutes, so quickly, one little thing I show you is that we recently discovered that the curvature of the racetrack can cause the domain walls to move at different speeds. So they no longer move together. And this is a very interesting effect that we hadn't appreciated, I must say, for many years. But now we know it's a huge effect. So for example, this is, a, this is some work from my student, Chirag Gag, and uh, it was published just recently. And you can see that here, can you see, this is again a Kerr image. This is the domain wall pointing up, and then down, there is pointing down and then up. So there are two domain walls. Now we apply a series of current pulses to apply these spin orbit torques, and the forward, the first domain wall, moves much faster. So the separation afterwards is much larger. And it turns out if we change the, the, the curvature for the domain walls by switching the direction of these uh, magnetizations, this is now we've effectively changed the curvature for the domain walls. In this case, the domain walls which are far apart become close together. 
So the front domain wall moves more slowly. So the curvature, it turns out, determines the velocity independent of the spin hall angle, the sign, and the Dirichlet-Schmidt immediate exchange interaction. And the difference in these velocities for negative and positive curved wires can be up to a factor of 10, just above the threshold for moving. Well, this is a very interesting effect that uh, we had to, this is uh, Sihun Yang had to develop a two-dimensional model following uh, analytical model, one-dimensional model, following the work of Malazimov and Slonczewski many, many years ago, to, so we could see what happens. And it turns out what happens is very simple. If you imagine this, you want a domain wall to move at constant velocity around this curved wire, you can easily understand that on the outer part of the wire, we have a lot more moments that have to be rotated. The numbers of moments goes like 2 pi times the radius. So you therefore you need more angular momentum on the outside than the inside. How do you do that? You do that by bending the domain wall, such that it has exactly the right curvature so that the torque derived from the current on that domain wall increases linearly across the wire. That's the only way to make the domain walls move at constant velocity around this wire. And that's what we find. And uh, OK, not time to discuss. And just as final aside, there are two very interesting time scales. So in order to move, to bend the domain wall, this takes tens of nanoseconds. On the other hand, within the domain wall, the domain moments in the wall will also rotate. That happens on nanosecond timescales. So the, the nanosecond timescale we can see in our experiments. And what it means is it takes tens of nanoseconds before the domain walls reach their terminal velocity in order to rotate this, this uh, curved wire. So I won't discuss it in any more detail. And it uh, turns out, again, if we go to the synthetic antiferromagnetic curved wire, we can eliminate the curvature because the, up, the lower and upper uh, domain walls counteract each other. So again, synthetic antiferromagnetic domain walls, super important technologically. And then since I'm running out of time, I just want to say that a very interesting technological application uh, in my mind is we could use a three-terminal single domain wall racetrack using the spin orbit torques, moving the domain walls at speeds of one kilometer per second to build a single element memory that could replace conventional SRAM. And many of you will probably know that the size of SRAM in conventional CMOS technology is, is exploding. It's about 300 F squared today, about 50 times the DRAM cell. And we believe with this uh, three terminal single domain wall racetrack, we could shrink SRAM by factors of five or so, maintaining the same speed. We could achieve picosecond speed using these very high velocities. Now, the final part of my talk, I want to uh, discuss uh, again a collaboration with Claudia, in which we've been looking at non collinear spin structures in a very interesting material. This is one of Claudia's Hoistler materials, manganese, platinum, palladium, tin. And what we this has an interesting magnetization versus temperature. The, at here, there's some kind of spin flop transition. This is a ferry magnet. So no time to discuss that. What we've done in, in my institute in Halle, we've upgraded our aberration corrected transmission electron microscope. So we can do Lorentz transmission electron microscopy. And some of you know that if you take a high energy electron beam, uh, it will be deflected by in-plane magnetic fields. And therefore, we can see magnetic structures with a resolution of about 5 nanometers. And so we take this, what is this Hoistler material, which is a tetragonally distorted inverse Hoistler material, and what we can see is we can see not skirmions, but anti-skirmions. And I can see in this workshop quite a few talks about skirmions. So just to briefly remind you, there are two types of skirmions, a block skirmion and a nail skirmion. You take a perpendicularly magnetized material, and under some conditions, the ground state under magnetic field will consist of an array of these little nano-objects called skimions, which are topologically protected objects in which the domain wall can either be of a block type, that means the magnetization rotates from up to down in a plane perpendicular to the wall or parallel to the wall, or nail type, where it rotates in a plane parallel to the wall. So you understand that? No. An anti skirmion is, as you go around the circumference of this object, the wall type changes from a nail type to a block type back and forth. Very interesting structure. It was theoretically predicted, but never seen before. And in these fantastic materials that Claudia makes, we can now see them. And just to remind you, in a Lorentz microscope, if you look uh, directly uh, to the skirmion, a nail skirmion is invisible because the, the, the electrons are simply uh, uh, you know, drift, drift uh, they're just pushed around the circumference. Uh, 
block skirmion, they push towards the middle, so you get a blob. anti skirmion you see two blobs of increased electron intensity and two blobs of decreased electron intensity, just like this, where this is coupled to the underlying lattice. And it turns out, theoretically, this tetragonal inverse Hoistler material can only support anti -skirmions. It cannot support skirmions, because what, what gives rise to a skirmion, just like the chiral domain walls, is a dielinski maria interaction, and the dielinski maria interaction vector has to follow the local crystal symmetry, and that only supports this type of uh, behavior. And that's what we see, so we see these beautiful uh, and this is now the Lorentz image. Here is a single anti skirmion, and we can see arrays of these. It's not a perfect array, but we see these arrays have a very wide range of temperature and field. And in some cases, you can see just single lines of these anti skirmions along edges. There's a thickness dependence that we're currently exploring uh, of the phase diagram. You can also see individual skirmions. And uh, Chang Ping Mao, one of my students in Hala, he's carried out micromagnetic simulations where he's um, introduced the correct vector uh, into oomph in order we could calculate the uh, anti -skirmions. And just uh, from, so from, I'm just, not, not too much detail, I think we have to finish, but basically we can then look at how the array evolves as a function of temperature and field by analyzing it uh, mathematically, and uh, we can even simulate, or he can carry out micro simulations to show how chiral phase will evolve into this uh, lattice yeah, not a, it's not a strong lattice, a weak hexagonal lattice of antiscomions into individual antiscomions and then nothing, depending on field and temperature, mimicking our experimental observations. And we can carry out very detailed analysis of our Lorentz images to look at uh, how closely these are hexagonal close packed or not. I don't have time to discuss that, and I skipped that, and I'm going to skip this because uh, we have no time. And we just uh, summarize spin orbitronics, I think, is a, a very interesting evolution of the field of spintronics over the last three or four years, which has led to the discovery of several new unanticipated phenomena, uh, including very large spin hall effects in nonclinear spin systems, triangular systems in many simple metals, and uh, these enormous chiral spin torques. And this, what well, we discovered, that both of these, the chiral spin torque and a giant exchange torque, leading to velocities uh, of domain walls induced by current 10 times higher than was theoretically possible just three or four years ago. And therefore, this makes, I think, this racetrack memory technology uh, super interesting. So, and then a final advertisement. If any of you are interested in a position at Halle, please email me. So, thank you very much.